This is Surpu today. This monastery was the headquarters of one of the main sects of Tibetan Buddhism, the Kajupa, founded in 1185 by the first Gyalva Kamapa, Dusam Kiempa. During the Cultural Revolution in 1966, it was totally destroyed, and all of the some 900 monks formerly here were driven away or killed. Until 1980, these ruins remained untouched. In the main temple, there were three big stupas containing the reliquaries of the lineage teachers, and there were statues of all the Karmapas up to the 10th Churjing Dorje. They were all destroyed, and not a single one left. It was all done manually. They used dynamite only for the great La Chen statue. Only one monk who didn't leave the country survived. When His Holiness Kamapa left Siapu, a lot of monks fled with him to seek him. The remainder fled over the next few years. But in 1959, I promised to remain here as long as the monastery still existed. At that time, my mother was still alive. I sent her away with my brother. It was chaotic. Everyone tried to escape the danger in some way. Most people fled with only a handful of grain. Apart from myself, Du Chen Kushu, my master, stayed here, and Umze Agu and Chirpe Penchola. We tried to save as much as possible here. In 1966, half dead from hunger, I dressed myself as a beggar and went to Kimo Long, where I survived. I heard there that the monastery had been destroyed shortly afterwards. A new generation of young Tibetans are eager to learn and believe in the same religious traditions that their forefathers practiced for many generations. <laughs> this is the monastery bookkeeper. He registers all donations and work hours invested in the reconstruction of the monastery. He started his work on October the 30th, 1982, when the Chinese authorities gave permission for the monastery to be rebuilt with a single grant of 100,000 yuan. With this money and donations and a private loan, they rebuilt the first temple. It took them one year. In 1984, Rupon Dechen Rinpoche came back from exile in India to oversee the rebuilding. He spends months every year traveling throughout the east and north of Tibet collecting donations, as at the present time. The people give mainly butter, cheese, tsampa, rice, yaks, horses, sheep, and also money. In Amdo, nomads are awaiting the arrival of the Rinpoche from Tsurpu. In this uninhabited area, it is a mystery where these people come from. The sun is hot, the wind bitingly cold, and in the morning the ground is frozen.
a truck appears bearing Drupon Dechen Rinpoche, who is traveling across the plain. His blessing has such great power to bring well-being that even animals benefit from it. The Rinpoche tries to visit as many places as possible. Thus, sometimes his stops are very brief, but of the utmost importance to the people. Often there is only time for a quickly improvised ceremony at which prayers are offered for long life, peace or good health, depending on what the people request. I just, this. The Rinpoche holds this ceremony to inspire and to empower the pilgrims to develop aspects of their own inherent wisdom and compassion. Monks give red cords as a symbol for blessing and protection. They distribute milk which has been consecrated also as a form of blessing. As I perform the rituals, I concentrate on the wish that all beings, our mothers and fathers whose number is as infinite as space, may receive goodness, happiness and joy. We are rebuilding the monastery with the motivation that all beings who are directly or indirectly associated with the monastery, but also those who have no link, will be cleansed of all negativity, and that their merit will increase, that they will have long lives, and after death they will not be reborn in the lower realms. I put my whole strength into these prayers. This method of giving voluntary donations has always been practiced in Tibet, instead of the compulsory taxes in other countries. The chief difference is that each individual decides by himself how much he can and will give. <laughs> When the Rinpoche stays overnight, the nomads help to put up the tent he has brought along for himself and his ten companions. This is the area where the previous Karmapas throughout history have come to impart the Kaju teachings and give their blessings. <laughs> The tent serves as living, sleeping and eating quarters for the whole party. In addition, all the religious ceremonies are held there. For 19 years, the Rinpoche meditated in strict retreat in order to transmit the positive and joyful energy of the universe. His followers are convinced of the spiritual powers he has developed. Because of his deep realization, he benefits others 
and fulfills the spiritual and mundane needs of many beings. Where the Rinpoche has been, they say, there are fewer storms, better harvests, and harmony in the families. The giving of donations is a practice of spiritual character which one of the nomads explained like this. In bringing about the awakening of the Buddha mind, we acquire the merit of selflessness by making offerings. And in addition, we acquire wisdom by perceiving that everything which we offer, all material things, in fact have no real existence. Wherever Tibetans come across an example of higher realization, in the form of a statue, a mountain, or a Rinpoche in his tent, they circumambulate it to express their respect. Unconditional compassion and love are the way to enlightenment. Never separate your spirit from compassion and love. If you are dealing with matter or with life, do it with love and compassion. That is the most important. It is the seed of enlightenment. This attitude is in harmony with nature and is right for all times. Because you have attained this life, you must use the chance for spiritual development, otherwise you will never be reborn as a human being. That might be an exaggeration, but not everyone will be reborn in human form again. In the lower realms, beings are as numerous as the particles in space. Compared with that, a rebirth as man is very, very rare. And it is even more unlikely that one will be reborn in Tibet and have the chance to be a Buddhist. If you have these opportunities, you should use them to overcome the ocean of suffering. For that, you need a good ship. That is the human body. No other state of being offers such a good vehicle. And to steer it safely, you have Buddha's teachings. But if you don't take this rare chance and let your life simply go by, then it is wasted. After four months of journeying through the outer regions, the Rinpoche and the monks arrive home once again.
After years of meditating in the lotus position, the 70-year-old Rinpoche can hardly stand. In exile in India, he declined the suggestion of His Holiness Kamapa to teach Buddhism in Canada. Instead, he took on the arduous task here. The Rinpoche is responsible for the health and education of 185 monks. For their building work, they receive an hourly rate from the donations, according to Chinese regulations. As for himself, he only owns the clothes on his back. All donations go towards rebuilding. To this end, he has dedicated his life materially and spiritually. This sheepskin cover is the only donation I use for myself, the shirt I brought with me from India. In return for the donations, I give the people pills which have been blessed to help them when they are troubled or ill. If they have faith, they can be healed by these blessed pills. The potency of this medicine is well known. That's why the people put their trust in it. For example, a pregnant woman will take a little before she gives birth. Then the child is born very easily. This donation of yak butter, sewn into a yak skin, is very valuable. Butter is used in large quantities, added to their salt tea, for burning in lamps, and frequently used in cooking. Only three of the 30 main buildings have been rebuilt so far. And to construct them with their ornamental interior is an enormous undertaking. These Tibetans want to see the destruction one day only as a short, if painful, interruption in the 2,000 years of Tibetan history. Removing the signs of the terror is part of the Buddhist attitude towards reconciliation and forgiveness. Everyone works towards this end. To restore the monastery to approximately the same condition as it was before 1966, like this, requires a lot more support than Tibetan nomads and pilgrims alone could ever give. As they do not receive money from the government, they are largely dependent on outside help. For the next incarnation of Gyalva Karmapa, three rooms have already been prepared and contain statues of all his 16 incarnations. Rangjan Rigpa Dorje, the last Kamapa, was born in Tibet in 1924. In the year 1974, on his first trip to North America, he bridged the Buddhist Dharma from east to west. He fulfilled the prophecies of Padma Sambhava, who also foretold in the 8th century, Surapu Monastery will be the center of the activity of the successive Kamapas who by their activity would liberate inconceivable numbers of sentient beings. Tibetans are sure that the new incarnation of the Gyalva Karmapa will one day come back here to Tsurpu. They believe in the success of the reconstruction 
because they are absolutely convinced of the strength and miraculous power of the deities. Many thousands of families in Tibet have close links with the Karmapas and have always given generously to the monastery. Their faith in Buddhism was greatly strengthened when Karmapa sent me back to Tibet to rebuild the monastery. They give help and support as in former times. Their determination and faith has not waned. On the contrary, they have grown even stronger. This is the place where, 800 years ago, the building of Surpu Monastery began. The first Kamapa sat here for many years, meditating on the mysteries of the mind. These mysteries are represented symbolically in the Lama dances at the Buddhist festivals in order to invoke spiritual awareness in the individual. Restoring the cultural heritage is as important to the Rinpoche as the actual rebuilding. He uses also donations to acquire many of these costly robes and ritual objects. Hundreds of Tibetans come to Surpu again twice a year when the Lama dances are performed. This is only a rehearsal. Without a monastery, there is no religious community or study of Buddhism. In a monastery, everyone who wants to learn can come and meet lamas and receive their teachings. The lamas explain what really brings merits and what is negative and must therefore be avoided. Inside the main shrine room, recently completed, the monks perform the protector prayers and offerings. The monasteries in Tibet were always the schools and universities, being the highest and most profound expression of Tibetan culture and tradition. The wisdom and knowledge achieved there through the last thousand years should be a heritage for the whole of humanity. Just as technology has been emphasized and developed in the West, and today benefits the entire world, while the West has developed the outer, the Buddhists have explored the inner dimensions and reached an advanced spiritual awareness.
Despite the influence of the Cultural Revolution, religion has still remained in the hearts of the Tibetan people and therefore will continue to exist for as long as Buddha's teaching exists. Now, Buddhism is spreading further afield than before. Formerly, Buddhism was completely unknown in the West. No one knew the meaning of Kaju, Gelupa, or Nyingmapa. Because of the events in Tibet, our teachers went to India and came into contact with Westerners, which resulted in the spread of Dharma to countries where it was previously not practiced. If the Sangha had not been destroyed here in Tibet, Buddhist teachers would not have gone abroad and the Dharma would not have spread to the world. One American who was inspired by Kamapa in 1971 is Ward Holmes. He has worked at the main seat of the Kamapa in America as treasurer and as Kamapa's personal driver. He completed the traditional three-year retreat in Canada in 1985. Many times His Holiness expressed a strong, deep interest in, in Tibet and his love for Tibet he expressed many times. So, so then when I came, then I had always been interested to see Tibet. So when I came here, I really felt the power of the blessings of what I think he was talking about. What has Rinpoche in mind to do with this place where we are sitting here? The general plan was to rebuild this whole complex, building a shrine and a library and a kitchen and then maybe five or six different rooms with two or three bed, beds in it and then one or two rooms would be allotted for uh, doing meditation retreat where the uh, person would bring food in and you wouldn't have to come out. To realize this plan, he has visited Rinpoche since 1986 many times and established the Shirpu Foundation in Hawaii to collect funds worldwide to rebuild the monastery. Our whole project is so vast, everything was destroyed at once. But to rebuild it is another matter. It is difficult to find enough laborers and building material. But I hope that everything will go quickly. The Tsurpu monastery is now very poor. To provide food, accommodation and everything for the visitors will be very difficult for us. This would have to be organized with your assistance. To develop with patience and persistence to learn these mudras increases the merits for good karma. Bad karma is the result of bad actions. Good karma is the result of good deeds. It is the principle of cause and effect. So the fate of the individual and the community is the result of their own behavior, both good or bad. Then why was Tsurpu destroyed? All the Kamapas from the 1st to the 16th have lived here. 
For this reason, the whole area is very blessed. People even believe that it is enough just to put one foot into the temple to avoid rebirth in the lowly realms. That this extraordinary place could nevertheless be torn down was not the result of the monastery's bad karma, but of the worldwide rejection of religion. It isn't always pleasant to live in these ruins, but I came here to help to eradicate all that was negative from the past. It was my own decision to become a monk, and my parents welcomed my choice. When Rinpoche came to see us in Amdo, I made my vows to him and accompanied him. You beat the drums in the ceremonies. Where did you learn to do it so well? Surely it wasn't difficult. I simply began and then after two months I was allowed to play in the pujas. And how long have you been a monk? I don't know. How long have I been a monk? Two years. Yes, since I was nine. How often do you go home? Once a year. But this year I haven't had time. It doesn't matter. I like being here. The monastery school. The teacher of the monastery school holds classes only in the mornings and evenings. Don't the children need support to study under these poor conditions? The teachings have nothing to do with the financial situation. It neither improves nor makes it worse. It is for their spiritual career. But for some of them, a financial support would be very helpful. They all come from very different backgrounds. Some children have nothing from home. What is the difference between a state government and a monastic school? There is a big difference. In the state schools they learn nothing about the spiritual science. Here the pupils progress step by step until they become masters. And after that many go into retreat into caves up there to meditate, to develop themselves individually. In this way, we can again offer the path of the Dharma, which many people want to follow. Teaching down in the village school, by contrast, is based absolutely on materialistic consciousness taught in Chinese, the so-called objective worldview. Ha. 
This is a village school, and our major subjects are Tibetan, arithmetic, and Chinese. Tibetan writing is indispensable for the continued existence of Buddhism. It can be learned only in the few monasteries which have been regenerated. The monks and their parents have a high opinion of the teachings of Buddha. Every Tibetan has faith in the religious way of life. They will continue to follow this way. Do children come to you from the monastery? No one has ever come from the monastery to go to school here, but our pupils often enter the monastery when they leave. The majority of Tibetan children attend schools like this, as far as they go to school at all. If the traditional wisdom of their parents is not passed on to them in addition, the cultural heritage of Tibet will be lost. Nemo, the only survivor of the Sirpu monks who did not flee in 1959, today guides young monks on a pilgrimage on the same trail that all the Karmapas have walked circumambulating the whole monastery complex. This Mani wall contains many ancient religious artifacts that survived the wrath of the Cultural Revolution. Many bodhisattva images and mantras are hand-carved onto stone plates. The trail crosses a cemetery where sky burials are performed. The pieces of clothing scattered around belonged to the dead. This is all that the vultures have left. Because the ground in Tibet is frozen for eight months of the year and wood for burning is extremely scarce, it became the custom to feed the corpses to the vultures as the most hygienic way of disposing of them. Occasionally, the birds leave behind fragments of bone too big to swallow. The relatives bring the corpse to the cemetery wrapped in a blanket. A man specially appointed unwraps the body and cuts it up, often using a knife which belonged to the dead person. This procedure is necessary so that the vultures can consume the body quickly and completely. This rock is a type only found in the Bodhgaya Cemetery in India, the place where the Buddha himself attained enlightenment. Legend has it that the rock miraculously flew over the Himalayas when Kamapa chose Surpu to be his seat. This is taken as confirmation that souls whose bodies are disposed of here will have a better rebirth. Another holy place along the trail is this impression in the rock of the back of the fourth Karmapa. It is believed that rubbing one's own back against it alleviates back problems. This hole is a test for pilgrims. Anyone who can't manage to crawl through must have sinned in some way. Another section of the trail is a test of courage.
When you are dead, you will experience the illusion of having to cross a terrifying bridge. But if you have crossed the Xingqiu Kangpa Bridge up there a couple of times, you won't be compelled to go through the illusionary experience. Foreigners comment on all the holy places on our path, saying, it's strenuous and you derive no benefit from it. Don't you think so too? For the monks, it is important and fascinating to go to the highest meditation cave above the Surpu Monastery, nearly 15,000 feet up because many Kamapas use this place to meditate. In the West, there are people of high intelligence and great knowledge. They have invented things capable of obliterating the whole earth and things that fly in space. But about life after death, and about where they will be born again, they know nothing. They have absolutely no conception. But Buddhism has developed teachings which enable a human being to determine his future reincarnation. For example, Karmapa is a human being with a human's appearance. But nevertheless, he is capable of specifying his future reincarnations exactly, as he has been doing since 1110, describing precisely in writing each of his 16 reincarnations. Soon, the Karmapa will be born again exactly where he foretold, giving us yet another proof that reincarnation occurs. And it would be unthinkable, wouldn't it, that only the Karmapa is reborn and not other people. This defaced hermitage of Chakra Samvara, called Demchog Podrang, also has to be rebuilt. A relic from the last Karmapa gives the pupils a special inspiration on the enlightened mind. Because Karmapa's mind was not limited to his body, he was able to see beyond death to his next life. He was also able to impose his mind on material things. An example of this is a stone with the imprint of his shoe during his childhood. For someone whose life is firmly anchored in materialism, such an occurrence is scarcely credible. For a Buddhist, it is a sign of highly developed consciousness. <laughs> Perceive that appearances do not truly exist. A person who has himself learned this wisdom and experienced phenomena as merely a product of the spirit knows that the material has no objective existence and that it can, as you saw on the mountainside, leave footprints in stone. As a child, Karmapa used to hop from rock to rock along the shores of Lake Latung. In his childish high spirits, he left footprints in the rocks. And because he went barefoot, you can see the imprint of each individual toe. Evidence of this advanced wisdom is preserved in another retreat above Surpu.
It was the retreat center of the second Karmapa, called Pema Chatsong, 700 years ago. After spending six hours on the path, Nemo and the monks return with a sense of satisfaction and mentally awake. Because it is never too early to prepare oneself for the inevitable approach of death, the little monks already are learning to use this life to liberate themselves from attachment to worldly existence. Buddha taught that all suffering comes from attachment and greed. Without the spiritual dimension, we search all our lives for material security of which we can't have enough, although we lose everything when we die. The monks search for their security in something permanent, which is inherent in the undying nature of the mind, thus giving them both peace and security. The snow-covered summit at the end of this valley is called Gyalha Kangsang. He protects this area and symbolizes also that the people helpful to Tsurpu are from outside the area. When Westerners are able to come here, it seems appropriate to this symbol. Could have effects on the West. Is there, or the other way, is it just a private? Having never been to uh, the the East, where where Buddhism is alive today, people ha sometimes have a very strict and rigid view about Buddhism, and it's not so rigid. It's very open and expansive. And I think when people come here, they see the the uh, the, the flowing qualities of the Tibetans, where they they're not uptight about if something goes wrong or anything. And and again, just the blessing of being in the East, I personally feel, is, is quite strong. And when you have that, then you're able, I think, to have much more inspiration when you're back in the West to practice meditation. But if you've never been to places such as this, then sometimes you, your meditation, you might uh, not have the energy to uh, continue on, you know, have lapses. When you listen to the sound of our river, you hear the mantra of Chakra Samvara, its power is secret, and the river holds it forever. The monks pray for an all-encompassing protection from the deity Mahakala. These prayers were the first that the monks made on their return to the ruins of Surpu. The wrathful appearance of the Mahakala expresses the transformation of envy, anger, jealousy, and hatred into compassion and love. The Tibetans offer their arms to him, his spiritual power being much stronger than earthbound weapons. His presence is prayed for every day for three hours. When people become too involved in their material and bodily needs, and repress their real spiritual nature that obscures the wisdom and purity of their teachings with catastrophes, wars and illness. The ruins are not obstacles on the path to Buddhahood or enlightenment. Mahakala protects the practitioners from all obstacles in their life and practice of meditation. His basic message is to engage in the right view the right livelihood, the right speech, the right action, and the concern for the happiness of all beings. His eminence, Jamgong Kongtrul Rinpoche, is one of the four lineage holders of Karmapa until his next reincarnation. 
he would now like to say a few words about how you can help. The rebuilding of the Tsurbo Monastery is not only important to the Tibetan community, it should also concern the people all over the world, especially the followers of the Kaju lineage, since, as you know, Tsurbo is the seat of His Holiness Gyawa Karmapa, and it will be definitely the seat of the 17th Karmapa too. Because of this, it will be one of the major places of pilgrimage. There, people will receive the blessing of the lineage and will be able to practice at our source. I therefore strongly urge all of the followers of His Holiness and friends of Buddhism to support the completion of Tsurbo Monastery project so that we may finish without any obstacles. If you would like to have further information about this project, please ask your center for details about Tsurbo Monastery Foundation. Thank you very much for your help. Bahari eh